All right, welcome all. Uh, great to have you. Great to have you on uh, online tonight. Oh, well, yeah, tonight, this afternoon, wherever we are. Um, if you could just all mute your microphones, that'd be fantastic. That's what we've got most people sorted, but um, we'll, we'll get underway as we we'll, people will keep coming in, but um, all will keep hopefully knocking off, knocking off their microphones as they come in. So, uh, yeah, welcome along. Uh, Gus Rose is with me. Uh, he's, I don't know where he is on your screen. He's next to me on mine. Um, yeah, so we, uh, so that today's talk is, yeah, well, today's, we've got three one-hour sessions is, is the plan, um, all around genetics of reproduction. There's been a recent change to that in, in sheep genetics, as in there's been new traits added over the last, well, there have been research breeding values, but now proper breeding values, which is, uh, giving us a bit, give us a few more tools to, to work on reproduction. Um, so we're going to talk mainly about those, those traits for this one hour session and then move into what happens if you haven't got those next session and then into um, you selection, the final, the final Wednesday. So three Wednesdays in a row. Um, I'll get underway with, with uh, a screen share. So yeah, session one, uh, welcome along and welcome as those as people join. Um, we've got 178 people registered, so uh, a heap of people that registered, not all online yet. We've got whatever we've got, 58 or so online. Um, yeah, so a little bit of background on, on us. We won't waste too much of your time on this, but yeah, I grew up in, in Victoria, uh, spent a bit of time around Hamilton, the southwest Victoria, over into WA, spent a bit of time with, with Gus there, and I'm now in... Uh, in New Zealand in Christchurch and locked up here for at the moment while the border's closed again. Gus, do you want to just give a quick intro into into your background? Yep. So I grew up in WA on a sheep grain farm, studied uh, animal science, um, did a master in ag economics, worked for the Department of Ag a bit on adoption of sheep technologies and did a PhD in animal breeding. And now I'm in Armidale managing sheep genetics. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah, so the plan for the three nights is really to build awareness of the potential strategies to make genetic gain uh, around you and, and really hey. focused on reproduction and, and lamb survival is, the, is this particular talk. Obviously, there's a lot of other things we need to incorporate mm -hmm. into a breeding program, but we really are just going to focus on reproduction for, the, for these three sessions. Um, so this is part of a producer demonstration site project that we've got running with MLA, as in Next Gen Agri have. Um, the plan is to have eight different sites over five years, comparing the outcome from kind of selecting your normal RAM team or selecting a RAM with a RAM team with superior reproduction, whether that's going a bit harder on those reproduction traits from your, your current source or or trying out a different source for, for the focus on reproduction. So we've got three of those sites running. There's an opportunity for five more. So that um, part of the reason for running this course is to to find those individuals that might be keen to to give out a crack and and with our support sort of test out test out some genetics that have that have been selected based on reproduction and, and just see how that plays out on a on a commercial commercial outcome. So yeah, three sessions. Repro breeding values main focus today. Uh, buying rams for repro next session. So we'll go through the sheep genetic site and what you might do in terms of what you might be looking at in the catalogs. Um, and then strategies for use selection is, is the final session. The whole thing is uh, going to be centered around in terms of when we're not online uh, around the hub, which is, which is our product where we share a lot of our information with our members and clients. There's an open access area where um, uh, that all public can get involved, uh, can get uh, access to and you, and that's where this project pages or spaces genetics of repro and lambing. Um, you will have been given sent a link to have access to that uh, over the last few days as you've registered. Um, and that is a space where you can come in and ask us questions between the sessions, um, put in your comments. Um, we've got a little bit of homework that you might do. And if you do, um, you can whack it in there and, and, and we can trade a, trade a bit of banter between, between sessions. Um, so that's a, and when we go into reproduction, uh, sorry, right into that space, you'll, you'll see here where we'll, where you can hit the link for next for next week's session. We'll put some and some info going to to that area. Really great spot. So um, 
uh, and encourage you to get in there and, and have a look around. Uh, we'd encourage your questions. Obviously, there's a lot of people online, so we'll do that via chat, uh, and all of will be monitoring monitoring that. Um, we will throw it open at the end if if there's anyone that we can you can unmute and, and have a have a ask your questions. But obviously, it really is critical to if you've got got those questions to get them out there. Um, we are a lot on, so if you don't get your question answered or don't even get it asked today. Uh, make sure you jump on the hub and ask it in there and we will monitor that and, and do what we can to answer those questions. Um, and before, so Gus is going to run through the the uh, the new traits and, and the sort of breeding values for reproduction. Um, this is, uh, we've got a few people joining from not in, a, not in Australia and for those that we are very much focused on um, on the Australian system, sheep genetics for, for these talks. Obviously, you'll find things that are relevant regardless but um we are focused on sheep genetics because it's a it's an mla project and we're and that's an australian system and an australian australian project but i guess i'm just going to go a quick intro before we before we hear from gus and really around i guess error I, the way i think about it error is the enemy of genetic gain so any selection decision we're making around uh around our genetics we're sort of littered with lots of error and that's just the fact that we're running sheep in extensive environments and, and we don't, we can't measure everything. So we're always got some error involved. I guess every time that error gets, or well, the higher that error is, the real consequence is a reduction in genetic gain because you're just not making accurate selection decisions because you haven't got the right, you haven't selected the right animals because error has gotten the road. So I guess that's what we're talking about. Reproduction is one of those traits and lamp survival, they're lowly heritable, um, lots of environmental impact and therefore there's a massive opportunity for error. So it's a really, I guess, of all traits, the reproductive traits are the ones where kind of get left to the bottom of the pile because, because they're hard, because they're um, because there's a lot of error involved. But that, I guess the point of the next three sessions is that it doesn't have to be that way. Yes, there's some error there, but there's, there's processes you can go through to, to remove or reduce that error. Um, we're going to talk a bit about heritability and I just wanted to quickly um, cover that off, uh, cover a couple of things off because we're going to talk a lot about breeding values and heritability and if, and if you happen to not kind of know what we're on about there, it's going to make it a bit tough. So just quickly, um, we're going to talk about heritability and it's defined in, in my way at least the proportion of the variation that, um, between individuals that can be explained by genes. So lots of what we see in measuring an animal is is kind of what I call white noise. Um, it's not not genetic. It doesn't breed on. And then there's a proportion of our, that difference between individuals that is genetic. And that's the bit that we're obviously interested in uh, in our selection programs. And yet often we're, look, we're left with a decision that's got a measurement or a visual that's that's a lot of white noise or a lot of non-genetic uh, 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 noise. And so the point is I suppose that reproduction is is the lowest heritability of the traits that we play with. Um, things like if you've ever if you're in the merino game, you'll be um, and you might have selected for micron at some point. Very very heritable. We can make massive gains and and mo a lot of the variation you see in any flock is is due to the genetics difference between those individuals. Growth back a bit um, resistant to worms and a lot of the traits that we sort of work on now in terms of health traits are around that twenty percent. Um, but reproduction is is lowly heritable. I guess that doesn't mean you just give up and, and not worry about it, but it does mean that you need to use lots of tools to get rid of that error or start to reduce that, that white noise. Um, and so in terms of we're talking error, but so there's error in the RAM selection, RAMs you're selecting. If, if we haven't got the right information, there'll be error involved in that. Your replacements, we're going to talk about that last um, in terms of which ones we select to stay into our, into our flock. There's, there's definitely error involved there. And then we've got adult use, which ones are we culling, which ones are we keeping? There's there's more error comes into our equation there. So particularly around our reproduction traits where we're, we're making um, decisions uh, with partial information, um, there there's, can be some error and that's what we're gonna try and talk about. Just quickly, um, in terms of why we're using breeding values, it's it's because most of what we see is not due to genes. You saw those heritabilities, most of them are below 50. And quite and and quite a bit below fifty percent of the variation being being due to genes. We've got different environments. We've got single twin triplet. We've got um, different locations, 
got some animals. If you're talking ram buying, there might be some animals that are housed. There might be different ages, and they'll definitely being fed differently. So lots of um, lots of things that make an animal look differently, um, which are not not genetic. The reason we're using breeding values is is to try and remove them from the from the from the equation. So we end up with a, an accurate selection decision or reducing some of that error down to a to a manageable level. So all those top line traits are accounted for in a breeding value by by knowing which group the animal's running with. So we obviously measure the measure reproduction by a scanning and then whether it brings a lamb in or not. Um, we take nutrition into account by this is when I make, this is a royal we, this is sheep genetics doing this. Nutrition is taken into account by managing groups in in their same group. So making sure we know which animals they've been running with and management's the same and the age of the dam is taken into account. And then what drives the, re, the the breeding value is 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 the pedigree of the of the of the animal. So knowing not just how that animal's performed, but how its how its grandmothers performed and how its grand great grandmothers performed for reproduction, and all its sisters and half sisters and aunties and all those all those uh, family members right through that family tree, their data coming together into that single breeding value is what really makes it a powerful thing, because it's not just that single measurement of a single animal. It's all the animals that that um, have accounted that have been that have had a reproduction measure or outcome uh, accounted for, and then then can come into come into that breeding value. Um, it also the breeding value will take into account whether that animal is a single twin or triplet. It takes into account the heritability of the trait, so the number you're looking at when you're buying that ram or selecting that ram to keep. Uh, is it's already taken that heritability into account. So it, it's saying, well, this is how many extra lambs you should uh, be expected to get from, from the daughters of this ram because we've already taken into account the, um, that, that heritability. Before we uh, do hear from Gus, I just wanted to throw it open uh, for you all to have a bit of a chat. We've, we do a lot of online forums these days and, and one of the feedbacks is that um, people are keen to sort of hear what other people are here. So, we're going to just open it for a few minutes um, and put you into into chat rooms. Um, there's three things I want you to talk about. One is where you farm and what type of sheep you've got. Um, the second one is, are you making genetic gain for ewe reproduction and lamb survival currently? And the third one is, how do you know? So what's your what's your proof? If you say you are making genetic gain, um, how do you know? So we'll now be, uh, all that we're putting into the chat group, we'll have about, um, we'll leave it for about five or five or ten minutes to have that chat, and then we'll be back to hear from from here from Gus. So I'm assigning rooms. You just need to accept um, the room that you've been put into, um, and you can start discussing. So just for the rest of you there, you just need to accept the um, notification that would have popped up on your screen just to join the breakout room. So just one or two have just joined us there and missed the start of the session. So just to let you know, we're joining breakout rooms um, just to catch up with a few, um, have a discussion and we'll come back.
So just for anyone that joined late there, we're joined breakout rooms at the moment just to have a discussion. Um, and this will allow people just to catch up for a few minutes and we'll be back in about five minutes. So just for the few that have joined us late there, we're in breakout rooms at the moment. So a notification will have just come up on your screen to join that room. Um, just have a few uh, discussion. The few in the room will let you know the few questions we're going through and we'll pop back shortly. Hi, Simon, I just seen that you joined us there now. We are actually just going into breakout rooms at the moment. Um, we did a short intro and so a notification will have come up on your screen to join um, the breakout room and we'll be popping back then to discuss what we've chatted about. Hi, Marianne. We're just um, in breakout rooms at the moment. So I'll just okay. pop you into a breakout room there um, and we'll, one second there now. So, and we'll catch up in a second.
So we should have everyone back there in the next 30 seconds or so. Cool. These are all the people who got late, are they? Yeah. Um, yeah, or that we're ignoring my request for uh, <laughs> to okay. join the breakout rooms. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. Right, uh, we should be all mostly back on deck now. Um, hopefully, you had a good chat with somebody and uh, and had a chat about these those three questions. We won't get you to tell us what you heard. Normally, we would, but there's too many of us online to to do that. But um, yeah, hopefully that was that was useful just to hear how other people are doing it somewhere else in the in the country. Um, now we're going to hand over to to Gus. I'll stop sharing. Gus, if you're all good to share your slides and tell us about the reproduction breeding bees. Right on. I don't have to wait until you stop. Yep. Yep. Okay. Before I start, I got a wrap from Mark for not being creative enough for my, the, <laughs> my presentation title, but I, I do work for Sheep Genetics, so I can't keep it too fancy. I've got to keep it pretty stock standard. Um, you can see my screen, everyone? Yeah, mate. Yep, excellent. All right, so I'm going to talk about breeding for reproduction today um, and what we're doing in terms of Sheep Genetics to improve reproduction for the industry and how you can now go to sales and be able to select rams based on reproduction and improve that within your flock. Um, first of all, Mark talked a little bit about heritability and our job at Sheep Genetics is to, to provide breeding values which the industry can use through Australian sheep breeding values or ASBVs. And what these breeding values do is really work out what the differences between animals in your flock or in, in the animals which we have in our evaluation, how much of that is due to the environment. And so the environment can be things which you can measure and know about, such as if a, a, an animal was reared in a twin litter or the age of the, their mum, for example, or for example, if they're managed differently or, or fed differently. And why these are important is because we can, these are things which we know we can remove from the, the differences between animals. And then we have the genetic component, which is essentially the breeding value or the ASBV, which when you go to a sale and buy a ram, you can see on the, the pen cards and in the catalogs and you can make decisions based on how, how good the genes are for an animal for a certain trait so that you have confidence that when you use those rams that it's going to improve the offspring in, that, in your flock. And this really drives off the relationship between animals. And then the white noise that Mark was talking about is really the bit which we can't explain. Um, and that's how we come up with the heritability is looking at the breeding values and how they explain the differences between animals compared to that other white noise. And up till now, if you've gone to a sale and if you use indexes, for example, you can see that we use number of lambs weaned as the trait um, in our evaluation. And this is simply how many lambs are weaned um, for each ewe which is joined. The thing about reproduction, of course, you're buying rams, but you can't measure reproduction on rams. So it's very much a, a trait which is measured in a ewe and that information is then used to predict breeding values for the, the size of the rams. What we've done since number of rams weaned is we've broken that up into three separate traits. So the first trait is conception, which is a yes or no. So if you're going to measure this trait, you're going to work out if yes, a ewe was mated and got pregnant or no, it didn't. So that's uh, simply if they get pregnant or not or conceive. The second trait is similar to number of lambs weaned, but it's litter size. So it's, it's more like the number of lambs which are born for each ewe. And this trait is only if the ewe conceives, then they, they get a trait for litter size. Um, so that's a little bit independent of um, conception. And then the third trait, which I'll explain in a little bit more detail, detail later, is the ewe rearing ability. 
which is the proportion of the litter which was born, which actually survived. And they are a little bit different to just counting how many in numbers of lambs weaned, and it gives you a lot more control, which I can explain in the next slide as well. So, for example, if we're using number of lambs weaned as a traditional trait, and we've got two ewes here that have both weaned two lambs. So, using the old analysis, we assume that their phenotype or what they produced was exactly the same. But if we look at how they produce those two lambs or weaned those two lambs and look at the litter size, you could have one ewe which had a litter size of two and one that had a litter size of three. So, then when we look at our ewe, Rearing ability trait. The, the top U is rearing a higher proportion of a litter than the bottom U. So this is important in terms of lamb survival and, and in our group, someone was talking about wastage. Um, this is how you can reduce that wastage in terms of making sure that more lambs, which you, you have lambing, actually survive until weaning. So that's why we split it up to give you more control and to to improve your reproduction in different ways. Because for example, you could have a high number of lambs weaned, but you could be getting that through high litter size, and then you can focus really on improving your uterine ability. Another reason why we split this up is because the analysis is better and we can give you better breeding values. And if you think about num number of lambs weaned, it's really the end product. And it's the product of all, everything that's happened since you put the ram in until you actually get into the the yards and draft off the lambs at weaning time. So when we do the analysis, all the management, everything you've done to the U between the time you put the rams in until you wean, it all it considers that whole that whole timeline, the whole reproductive cycle. What we can do now, since we've split up these traits, and in terms of giving you better breeding values, which are more accurate, we can for conception we only include what's happened between, you know, putting the rams in or just before up until the, the ewe gets pregnant and the rams come out. Also for litter size, we can just focus in on that, that management from when the rams go out and they get pregnant up until um, they give birth. And so you're lambing time. And then for the uterine ability, it really focuses on that time between when, you, when the, lamb, the ewe gives birth up until when they're weaned. So this gives better breeding values than having them all put in together and gives you more control over, over how you can control those three different periods in terms of improving your genetics. In terms of interpreting the breeding values, so you can go onto our site now, these three traits are Australian sheep breeding values or ASBVs, um, which means that they are now across flock. Um, so for example, if you're looking at litter size, if you're buying a ram with a, a breeding value of 0.38, then you know that um, on average, if you're going to, um, the daughters that you produce from that ram are going to have an extra 0 0.19 lambs in their litter size. So it's number of lambs weaned was presented as a percentage, which um, was showing, you know, the number of extra lambs weaned per 100 ewes joined, essentially. So these traits are literally, you're getting more Lamb, more daughters conceived for you June, per you joined. You're having more daughters have more lambs, or daughters having more lambs. And then in terms of urine ability, it's showing that the proportion of those lambs that are born, there's going to be a high proportion of those surviving. So they're the three traits, and that's how you interpret them if you're going to a sale. And you can see here on our website, we report the accuracies and then the percentiles in terms of where they sit in. Um, in the evaluation in terms of all the animals we have for um, 2019 year drop. In terms of the heritability, I put these up. Um, these are a, a bit of a prediction across the analyses. The, the story here, like Mark said, sure, the heritability is quite low for these traits. There is differences such as litter size has a better heritability than, for example, uterine ability. And you can imagine that makes sense because there's lots of things going on in terms of lamb survival once they're born up until weaning, especially in those early days when they're born. And it also includes things like milk production. So it's essentially different genes working to, on lamb survival compared to litter size. Give, 
given that the heritability is low, you think there's no point worrying about it, but it's not just the heritability we care about. It's also the variation within the population and how you can actually select for animals which have better breeding values for these traits and actually make gain. So if you look at the percentiles in the merinos at the moment, and these you can find on our website, search site, you can see there's a quite a big difference between the mean and then, for example, for litter size um, in terms of the top animal, which you can find. Of course, you need to balance this with all the other traits in the that you might want to select for at the same time. But this gives you an indication of if you did want to make selection and choose rams which have good breeding values, you can make reasonable process progress in um, in reproduction, because it is often something which the breeders and you know you if you're going to buy a ram say that the heritability is low, we shouldn't worry about it. We should worry about it with um, management alone. But as Mark said, it's important to, to combine both of those things. And then when you think about, we've got lots of variation in reproduction. And when you're changing the genetics in your flock, that's something which is permanent and it happens incrementally. So you don't lose that change. For example, management and environment are not passed on. One thing that you also, of course, need to think about is how once you improve reproduction, how you need to alter your management to make use of those, for example, extra lambs that you might be having. Um, and that's something which there's lots of information about and lots of ways that you can do that. So balancing, of course, genetics, we provide you the tools to improve reproduction and it's up to you to see how you can get that and fit it into your system and how you might manage your sheep differently um, based on those improvements. And the good thing about reproduction, which is, is that you're improving the number of lambs which you're producing. And if you're also producing other traits, you're effectively increasing that expression in your flock. You also have more to choose from as well. So you're actually getting more lambs, which actually, for example, grow faster or grow more wool or better quality wool. So all those things combined make it quite a important trait. And when we look at the economic value of reproduction and having more lambs, it is really quite high. And then compared to other traits, and then given that the, the variation is still there, you can still make progress and improve the product, productivity and profitability of your flock. So it, it really is a profit driver for, for your business. I put up some genetic correlations and the, the message I want you to get here is that the correlations between the traits are generally quite favorable, but they're also quite low. So you can in general change conception, uterine ability and litter size independently. There are some, some correlations there which are important and there's slight correlations such as between litter size and uterine ability. So it's saying that in general, if you're gonna select for higher litter size, it's gonna reduce your uterine ability. So it's saying that some of those genes which are used for improving litter size aren't that good for um, lamb survival. But again, it's only a slight correlation. So really the, the message here is look at the breeding values and you can find animals which are going to be good at all those traits independently and, and you can still make, make genetic gain on all of those. So that's something important to, to take in consideration. Gus, before you go on, there's a, just yep. a, a question cool. in the chat which Mark Mortimer has answered, but um, Daniel Wheeler's asked, if I read that correctly, the difference between the top animal and the top one percent is similar to the difference between the top one percent and the mean. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So that's you're talking about the percentiles. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's the top animal. So that's the very best animal from the 2019 you drop in a marine yeah. analysis. Yeah. Yeah. And that just sort of, I guess, sets our. That sort of says, well, that's that's what's possible. So let's work out a way to, to get there, kind of thing. Yeah. But then again, yeah, there, that's quite an extreme. Control. Yeah. The yep. top one percent gives a better idea of, you know, the top of the population probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a bit of MLA um, propaganda, I guess you can say. But we are we are actively working. And one other good thing about the, this new reproduction analysis is that these three traits are included in a genomic analysis, so in a single step, which means that. Um, if you're genotyping at the same time, you can get some of those benefits, for, especially in terms of accuracy for these traits. Um, and especially since you can imagine in, if you're selecting size based on reproduction, if you wanted to get accurate breeding values for, for size and select them at a young age. So for example, if you want to use ram lambs, 
it's pretty hard to do for reproduction if they haven't had um, any daughters yet to express that trait for you. You can only really get it based on, you know, sisters and mothers, aunties and those kind of relatives. So it is quite an important trait in terms of genomics because you can select earlier and get improve that generation interval. So improving generation interval means that you're using young rams which should have better genes. So you're getting those genes into your flock a lot faster and you can get a lot better genetic progress. So we have... Um, we're starting to co-invest with some breeders um, to help improve that reference population by um, paying for a proportion of the genotypes so that we can get more animals with good reproduction records and genotypes. And that's essentially what a, a reference population is. It's just animals which have good records of something and preferably for a trait which is difficult to measure like reproduction where you have to wait until they get to a certain age and then wait for them to have lambs so you can get that, that trait into sheep genetics. And um, especially for reproduction also where you've got a lower heritability, you need a lot more records to get the benefits from genomics. So that co-investment is helping us to build that reference and, and make it better for the industry and help them to, to use our breeding values and genomics. So to summarize, we've We've got uh, three new traits, which help you to get uh, more control for improving reproduction. And they are an improved analysis over the number of lambs weaned trait that we have. So if you're going to sales, start asking and looking for these and start looking on the website to see how you can start using them. Um, it does improve lamb survival, but I have to put a caveat because it is from the U side. We are looking into the future to see how we can improve lamb survival from the animal itself, which is a different trait. So that would be if a lamb is born and if it has the ability to actually survive to weaning on its own merit, not relying on its mum, for example. So trying to disentangle the difference between um, you survival from the mother side and also from the actual lamb itself. Um, so that was a quick run through, Mark. Um, Thanks, Gus. So just a couple of questions which we didn't cover earlier. Um, Linton's asked how much benefit is just using sires that are born twins to increase repro rather than the breeding bay itself? Yeah. Is that, I think that's something you're going to cover next week in more detail, isn't it? Yeah, but you can yeah. answer it now. Yeah, sure. So there's, <laughs> if you're selecting just, so for example, if you're just keeping ewes that have two lambs, and expect them to have better genes. That's it. Still has an untangled effect of the environment or management and your breeding values. And there's other things which can affect. You know, if you keep a ewe which has two lambs, you, it often does have two lambs next year. But that's rep, that's not exactly genetics. It's often the repeatability of the trait or the expression. So, um, I think maybe because you have better slides to explain that, Mark. But in terms of the breeding value, of course. The phenotype itself does explain a proportion of the, the genetics, but we really need to disentangle that management and all the other bits and pieces to get that breeding value so you can use that to, to improve reproduction. Yeah, cool. And uh, Anne's just made a point that uh, within their chat room that often NLW breeding values aren't available in, in catalogs. And I guess that's one thing that, as an industry we've been trying to work on for a couple of decades um and now i think probably the last couple of years has been the most growth that we've seen in in number lambs weaned or well, reproduction data coming in so that number lambs weaned breeding values could be generated and now these new these new breeding values um i guess one thing to chat about is is that this could just look like a whole new level of confusion we've got three three traits where we used to have one um and unless I wasn't listening, did we talk about um, how what I guess the problem with NLW was? What the what what was what's wrong with the with the group trait? I suppose. Yeah, so the the group trait for a couple of reasons it was in terms of the analysis, it looks at the whole reproduction cycle. But in terms of correcting for management, breaking it up into three bits, you can really focus in on how to manage before conception, before. Um, lambing time and before weaning. So it does, in terms of the breeding values themselves, they're a lot better to estimate and they're a lot lot better than looking at number of lambs weaned in total. Um, we have talked about, once we've split them up into three, how we can combine them together to still 
make one one trait that you can use because that's common feedback we get is that number of lambs weaned was simple. You go there, you know you're going to wean more lambs. Um, so we are looking at ways to combine these three traits, which are more accurate, into a an equivalent to number of lambs weaned, which is again more accurate than the current um, number of lambs weaned trait. Um, and I guess another point to that is um, oh, the genomics. So number of lands we didn't have genomics included in analysis, but now we're, it's included in single step. So that, that is an extra bonus. Cool. Um, there's a chat there. You, there's a question there from Steve, which is the correlation between litter size and condition score, which Anna's answers is 0.05. I don't know whether that, I don't trust Ian on that one. Yeah, I can check that. Um, all good. Any questions for Gus in the chat or we'll give um, a couple of minutes. Oh, Ian's got that from Kim Bunter's paper. So yeah, right. Yeah, good. that'd be pretty good. I can have a look just to see what, and that, that's in Reno's I'm guessing then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mark Moore, do you want to comment on um, selecting for NLW within your flock and making gains? What that sort of what you saw that actually changing? Uh, yeah, so I guess I mean certainly selecting on the breeding value of NLW changes the NLW breeding value you get back, um, which is not very helpful. So, but it's very difficult to then plot those changes against reality given the seasonal variations that we can see on the farm. So if I've been improving my NLW by 1% or 2% a year, I can have, you know, a 10 or 15% variation from year to year in real lambing. So it's, it's difficult to plot. Um, the only thing I can do is chase individual sire lines. So chase the daughters of individual sires that are predicted to be high versus low. And I do have quite a good correlation um, between the outcome of individual sires, their daughters, and the NLW of those rams, yeah. um, which makes sense because that's the data it is based on. So if I go back and, and pull out individual sires, because individual sires, I do have quite a large range. So some sires do really well and some are absolutely woeful. Um, and the breeding values do reflect those extremes. Cool, thanks, mate. Yeah, um, those sheep are getting a good feed behind you there. The, um, <laughs> the Dale's asked... Gus, how will these new ASPVs be used in the indexes? Yeah, it's a good question, Dale, because um, at the moment we're using number of lambs weaned. And if we're going to go to the new analysis, we've got to think about how we can fit those new traits in. So we are working on how we can change those economic values between those three traits because they are, in a way, they do interact quite a bit. Because if you can imagine you increase litter size, the value of your ability can change as well. Um, over time, it's not really linear. So it's something we're working on and we want to incorporate into the indexes as we go forward. Cool. I don't know. Is that an answer? You're nodding, Dale. So that, that's all right. <laughs> I can't tell. Oh, there's Dale. Yeah. Cool. I mean, if I can just quickly answer, the time will tell. Like, if, if have you guys done the economic analysis of them? Because they're all have it, going to have a different outcome. And if you're going to include all three, they're all going to have a, you know, you're going to probably diffuse that across the whole range, I would have thought, and dilute it out. Yeah, muted, Gus. Muted, sorry. Yeah, the value of one might be diluted out by the others because you're improving litter size, for example, the value of your ability might decrease. Is that what you mean? So it depends on where you are in your flock for a certain trait. Yeah, well, because obviously the index is you can't include every single trait and value them all the same. You're adding yeah. three new ones in there. It's all about obviously the weighting you're going to have to give them as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a good point because you can imagine that depending where you are for conception, um, there might not might be much value in improving that compared to litter size because, you know, you want to improve litter size or uterine ability. So that's something which we have been working on. Number of lambs weaned was a bit simpler, but um, yeah, we... We can either combine them into a single trait and then put a value on it, like number of lambs weaned, or we could split them out and put an individual economic values on it and then look at the consequences of doing that for the different traits. 
and the response you'd get from those as well. Thanks, guys. Well, um, I'll just flick to some... Oh, hang on, we've got another question. Is it going to be possible to use litter size to limit triplets in commercial merino systems, which often struggle to manage these? So, yeah, is it possible to select for more twins but less triplets? And that's certainly something that's happening in New Zealand. Yeah, so how do I do it in New Zealand? Uh, well, there is a slight... It's even lower than everything else, but it's yeah, slightly heritable. You can select for twins rather yeah. than... So select against triplets, essentially. Yeah. They also do that in Ireland and UK. Um so in terms of how you use these breeding values, it'll depend on where you are in your flock. And a, a bit of a problem with that, that trait is that you're actually reducing the variation. So you're trying to breed towards one value, which is often difficult. And that's why the heritability is often not as good because it is a bit different. I suppose that if you, you really need to see how you are in terms of what your flock's producing and then put different weightings on, say litter size or your rearing ability to make sure that if you're having twins that they survive for example yeah you know? i guess what we saw with nlw was largely we selected for litter size because it's the most heritable of the three component traits um and so we ended up with higher litter size and i guess your rearing ability is like in that case if you wanted to yeah not definitely not make any more gains on litter size and really keep more alive then you just put all your effort on era and your rearing ability rather than rather than litter size yeah. And it's something which when you're having a balanced selection is important in that case. And as you, for example, if you did want to increase a little size, then you could change your emphasis across time to put more on uterine ability. I guess that's Daniel, that your question about selecting for uterine ability would help triplet survival. Um, and, and what do you mean by how do you go about improving ERA? Do you mean with the well, breeding values or? You just sort of mentioned that it was a solution to um, try and address the mortalities in models, but mm. I just think it's going to be a really tough one to change, isn't it? Because in some environments, you don't get a lot of variation. There's a lot of lamb survival. And, um, and I know it's related to the maternal behaviour score. Yep. But, you know, I just, I think in the long term, I'd be interested you know, as to how we can go about improving that because it will be quite important. Yeah, definitely. So we do ha also have a maternal behaviour score breeding value, um, which you can also use to improve that, um, to make sure that the mother is staying around once she's given birth. In terms of uterine ability, I guess this trait, which we have, can help you if you are having, have a higher litter size and making sure more a high proportion of those actually survive. Is that what you mean? Yeah, and I guess yeah. and there is that very small but positive relationship with fat and muscle. Yeah, and there's also, of course, management needs to be adjusted for changes in any of those traits to um, make sure that you're managing them to express those that extra lambs as well. So I guess that's an important message as well is to make sure that you, you're balancing your management with your genetic decisions or your breeding decisions. Right, oh, no, we'll just keep moving um, and yeah, keep tapping those questions into the chat. And we've got we've got nine minutes. We're going to keep this for now. People have got things to do in the evenings, um, and we'll be back on next week or the next hour. But um, I'll just share my screen again um, and just move towards summing up. But we'll have a few more questions at the end. Um, what I'd be pretty keen for people to do is uh, we'll set you a bit of homework, um, and so this. Uh, spreadsheet it's just an excel spreadsheet it'll be it's sitting it'll be it's not there yet but it'll be sitting on the hub uh, once this is finished um so it'll be keen for you to download that and just answer go through um the aim is to get you to a hundred total score but that's a pretty tough ask based on how i've weighted it um so it, they're all just drop down menus um this is not a live version but um and so it's just drop down measure uh, venues uh menus to go through um, and it's really just setting up for what we're going to talk about next week, which is some of the correlated traits with reproduction um, as well as the reproductive traits themselves. Um, 
and yeah so if you wanted to flick through that and give yourself a score that'd be great um love for you to, to then screenshot it and shove it on the hub for us all to have a look at if you're if you're brave if not don't worry about it but um uh yeah it's just to get you thinking really about the top of and it's sort of to answer the question that um was in Nan's chat room that we don't have we don't all have nlw um breeding bays available to us at the moment um we've got some ram breeders have obviously been doing it forever and then others that are just starting out um some obviously some breeders don't have any breeding maze at all um but yeah so it's just a what would you look at in your ram team if if you didn't have any data as well as which data should you be looking at i suppose so um that'll be up there for you to do in the next seven days between when we meet again um would just encourage you to go on go on the hub and uh and yeah leave your comments have your get your questions in there if you're interested in, in finding out more you've thought about something since we've talked um we're going to get we've sort of had a bit of the theory around the, the breeding values today and the aim is to get into yeah, kind of trying to how to apply the the various things you could do to improve reproduction at home